Kimbrough is a popular writer and speaker whose topics focus on leadership, excellence, and achievement. His interviews of America's most outstanding black achievers focus on what it takes to be successful. These are summarized in his books, speeches, and included in a PBS broadcast. His speaking engagements have taken him to the CIA and several major corporations. Dr. Kimbrough was past director of the Center of Entrepreneurship at Clark Atlanta University. He co-authored the book, Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice, after being contacted by the Napoleon Hill Foundation. Dr. Kimbrough was listed in Who's Who in Black America, the Dale Carnegie Achievement Award, and he has appeared on The Larry King Show, The Today Show, Sonya Live, and has been featured in publications including Success Magazine, Black Enterprise, Ebony, Essence, The New York Times, and USA Today. He is a friend, and we mean a good friend, of George Frazier, and now he's a friend to all of us. Please put your hands together, make him feel welcome. Matter of fact, stand up, because this is some good stuff you're about to get. Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. Thank you very much, George. I'm glad I wore clean underwear today. <laughs> 50 million speakers out there, and you selected me. I am honored. I bring you greetings from my school, Clark Atlanta University, where I'm an old country business school professor. If you haven't heard from us, give us about 18 months. We'll be all over the radar. Thank you, George Frazier. My God, what one man, one individual has wrought. I am honored to be in your presence. Though we had to leave early, thank you, Earl Graves, who took a chance nearly 12 years ago on a young, aspiring writer to not only give him four hours of his time, but to give me the platform to take my first book, Think and Grow Rich, a black choice, and place it in the stratosphere. Thank you, Yvonne Pointer. Where is Yvonne? <clears throat> Yvonne Pointer took time out of her busy schedule to take me up on my request to send me a letter that is so prof excuse me, profiled in my fourth book. And thank you, Black America. Speaking of my fourth book, particularly Black women, for making my book, though it's only been out less than two months, number one book in black America right now. For five, five and a half years, I went around the country and I asked 1,000 black grandmothers if you could write one letter to your children or to the next generation, what would you tell them about life? What keeps me standing is the result of that book. I received letters from the state of New York all the way to Hawaii, both sides of Canada. Throughout the Caribbean, I even got a letter from a black grandmother in Ghana, West Africa. Let's get this party started right. I read you one letter. January 4th, 1999, Hampton, Virginia. This grandmother entitled her letter, Where There Is Hope, there is life. At some point in life, you'll be faced with a crisis that seems so overwhelming, it will shake you to the core. A loved one dies, a marriage crumbles, disease strikes, a child goes astray, or life savings are squandered. But this I know, into each life, a little rain is going to fall. In January 1992, I was diagnosed with cancer. Following surgery, I faced months of chemotherapy. Each treatment lasted four hours and left me so weak I needed assistance just to function. I lost my appetite as well as weight in my hair. Well, that came out in clumps. Being bald was the least of my worries. I had to learn to inject myself as part of the treatment to keep my white blood cell count up. To be honest, Cleveland, Ohio, success networking, I didn't know if I was going to make it. I had nearly given up hope in my hour to need. The Lord spoke to me as he so often does. And I thought, this is not the end. 
I mean, what can cancer do? Cancer cannot control my outlook. Cancer cannot steal my faith. Cancer cannot invade my spirit. It will not erase my memories and it will not shatter my hope. Where there's hope, there's life and I choose to live. I thank God to be able to wake up each morning and move under my own power, but if I didn't, Cleveland, I'm confident I can handle it. There's still hope for me, and if not for me, then for someone else. I would instruct my doctors to give my eyes to the boy who cannot see, to give my ears to the little girl who cannot hear, to give my heart to the woman who has known nothing but pain, and to give my kidneys to the child chained to dialysis. Regardless of your circumstances, you have so much to hope for. Marie Burnett, come to the edge, she said. They said, we are afraid. Come to the edge, he said. They came, he pushed them, and they flew. Let others lead small lives, but not you. Let others cry over small hurts, but not you. Let others leave their future in someone else's hands, but not you. Well, I want to take my time, my little feeble remarks, 20 minutes or so. I'm an open book. You know what I've done. I'm no secret. Some of you have read parts of my first book or third book, What Makes the Great Great. You know that when I got my fancy PhD degree from Northwestern University, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I certainly knew what I didn't want to do. At the time, I don't want to be like many of my colleagues, ran off from Chicago, Washington, D.C., wanted to work in one of the federal administrations. I didn't want to do that. Ironically, I didn't want to go the corporate route, though I did work in corporate America for 10 years until I finished my first book. What was more ironic, I didn't even want to teach. And here I am, just a B-school professor, and I'm completely fulfilled by that. All I wanted to do, I wanted to find the answers to two questions. Question number one, why does one person succeed while another fails? And question number two, why is one individual rich and wealthy while another is impoverished? So I carved out a list of 50 peak performers, high achieving black entrepreneurs, black men and women who carved their name on the tablet of success. They didn't know me, but I knew them and I was going to meet and interview them at point blank range. Well, that list grew from 50 to 100, from 100 to 150. I quit counting. At 150 interviews. You name them, I probably interviewed them. What makes the great great? I asked Percy Sutton, owner of the Apollo Theater. He says, if you have but one wish, let it be for an idea. What makes the great great? I asked Quincy Jones, the famed musical producer. I said, Mr. Jones, lay it on me. He says, success occurs when your critics respect you, when your children love you, when you have peace of mind. What makes the great great? I went in and interviewed Mae Jemison, first black woman in outer space. I said, my God, Dr. Jemison, a physician and an astronaut too, when did you get that idea? She said, I knew exactly what I want to be at age eight. I said, well, lay it on me, darling, I'm ready for it. She said, you can find it in the word lifestyle. Life is God's gift to you, style is what you make out of it. What makes the great great? I came here to Cleveland, Ohio, spent a day with Don King, the fight promoter, and we walked the streets of his old neighborhood, and his cronies were all around him. I said, Mr. King, please give me the answer. May Jimson just told me I could find the secret in lifestyle. He stroked his face and he said, closer to the truth. Look for it in the word enthusiasm. I said, enthusiasm, is that it? He said, yeah, if you set yourself on fire, the world will come see you burn. What makes the great great? I spent four hours with Janetta Cole, past president of Spelman College. And I said, Dr. Cole, please give me the answer. She said, show me somebody content with mediocrity and I'll show you somebody destined to fail. I went to Washington, D.C. and before his tragic flight, Ron Brown, Secretary of Commerce. I said, Mr. Brown, I am so honored to be here, Mr. Secretary. I said, let's talk about leadership and success. He said, leadership? That's something I do know. There's only two requirements of leadership. Number one, the price of leadership is always loneliness. And number two, you can never be concerned what other people think, say, or do. What makes the great great? Mr. Earl Graves left. Spent four hours with him. I had my tape recorder going. He told me something that he did early in his business career, and I made an off-the-cuff remark. I didn't think he heard me. 
I said, oh, Mr. Graves, that's impossible. He said, what did you say? I said, that's impossible. He said, come here, young man, come here. Cut that tape recorder off. Come here. I want to make eye contact with you. I want to make sure that you understand what I'm about to tell you. He said, don't let me ever hear you use the word impossible. If there's any such thing that I've uncovered in my business career, there's no such thing as impossible. Granted, overnight, the impossible may not become possible. But over time, the impossible certainly will become possible. So what makes the great, great? I could give you sound bites of all the individuals that I interviewed. I came full circle when I interviewed Ben Carson, arguably the greatest neurosurgeon in this country. I interviewed him twice. I said, Doc, give me the answer. He said, think big, think bold, think stretch, think global, think quantum leap, but Lord have mercy, think. I found four common chords in all these men and women. Number one, they dreamed big dreams. They had a dream, a passion, something they desperately wanted to accomplish in life. Point number two, they were inner-directed versus outer-directed. In other words, they weren't so quick to believe well-meaning friends or family members who said, you can't do this, you can't do that. They walked to a beat of a different drummer. And that's why the old poet Robert Frost was so apropos when he wrote years ago, Two roads diverge in the wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. In other words, you are unique. You cannot succeed being like everybody else. You must take that lonely road. Right now, there are 21 different ways to market or sell a product or service. Did you know that? Entrepreneurs in the mix, 21 different ways to market or sell a product or service. Number one is word of mouth. Number 21 is internet. Number 20, television. Number 19, radio. Number 18, segmenting magazines. Number two, flyers. Anybody send out a flyer? Number seven, advertising on a bench at a bus stop. Number nine, advertising on top of a truck. So my hotshot MBAs at CAU say, Doc, why would you want to advertise on top of a truck? For people who live in high rises. <laughs> But differentiation is the key. What is so different and unique about you? You will be judged in this corporate climate, whether you're a corporate climber or an entrepreneur on three traits and three traits only. Number one, your talent and range of experiences, what you bring to the table. Number two, how well you can take a group of individuals and move them towards a common objective, executive team building. And number three, your commitment to the bottom line. Point number three, they dedicated themselves to lifelong learning. I mean, make no mistake about it, you don't go to school one period of your life. You're in school every day of your life. Life is lesson. So you confront life as if you're about to have a major exam, and it doesn't take much to succeed. Why? Because the average individual won't take the time to seek out the information. I mean, look around and see who's not here. Look at the data. Only 3% of Americans have a library card. 58% of adults never read a book after high school. 600,000 words in the English language, the average adult in our society uses the same 1,200 over and over again. What George Frazier just did with the scholarships is critically important. Why? Because what's the latest data? If I had a room full of black males, 18 years old, seniors in high school, all of them graduating, only one out of five going to college. Compared to black females, 50%. The average black male, 18 years old, watches 18 hours of TV a week, listens to 12 hours of rap a week, on the phone nine hours a week, and practicing basketball eight hours a week. So what am I trying to say? If you want to succeed, all you got to do is show up. If you show up, you'll beat 80% of the competition. If you show up on time. <laughs> You'll beat 85% of the competition. You show up on time with the plan, you'll beat 90% of the competition. If you show up on time with a plan and a commitment to carry it out, you'll beat 95% of the competition. But Lord have mercy, if you show up on time with a plan and a commitment to carry it out and execute it, you'll make the cover of Black Enterprise Magazine. It doesn't take much to succeed. And last but not least, point number four, they flat out refused to fail. I'm not saying they didn't fail. Many of them actually failed their way to success. But failure was never a viable option for them. There's a quote in my first book from Confucius that reads, a man and woman is great, not because they haven't failed, 
A man or woman is great because failure has not stopped them. So three quick points, get a vision. Somebody better get excited about you and Agnes, you better pray it's you. Get a big dream. You're only on this planet for two reasons and two reasons only. Number one, spiritual growth. I did not say religion, I said spiritual growth. And number two, find your life's purpose. The dream is already here, that's why you're created. You don't come here to chase your dream, the dream is here, you gotta find your dream. So what is my question? What are you gonna do with the rest of your life that you have left? <laughs> See, time's not running out, but your life is. So what are you going to do? You get a big dream, you get a big vision. I shared this story and you heard me say it before, but it bears repeating. Because Nike brought me in twice to speak true story. When Magic Johnson played basketball for the Lakers, he wore Converse shoes and he begged Converse, begged them. But you guys develop a gym shoe and name it after me. Converse, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. Who in the hell's going to buy a gym shoe named after an athlete? Black males, <laughs> you're 6% of the population, you buy one out of every five pair of shoes Nike manufactures, but we won't talk about that, that's a sermon for another day. <laughs> Phil Knight of Nike shoes could see from a distance what Converse couldn't see up close. He gets a hold of the Chicago Bulls schedule. True story, Michael Jordan's personal attorney took me to lunch, I couldn't interview Jordan, but he allowed me to spend about, you know, a few hours with him. Phil Knight and Nike Shoes get the Chicago Bulls schedule, and he calls Michael Jordan back in Chicago. Jordan picks up the phone, he says, who is this? So this is Phil Knight of Nike Shoes. You know what Jordan said? How did you get my number? Uh, listen, don't worry about it. I got the Chicago Bulls schedule in front of me, and I see when you guys are coming to Portland to play the Trailblazers. Jordan says, so? He says, I also see that you have an off date behind that game. Jordan says, well, what do you have in mind? He says, do us a big favor, instead of flying back to Chicago, come by our Beaverton headquarters, we want to take a mold of your foot. Jordan says, why? Uh, we're thinking about developing a gym shoe and calling it the Air Jordan. But even Phil Knight suffered from myopia. All Phil Knight wanted out of the deal was $10 million. Enough to recoup the first production run of Air Jordans. First production run of Air Jordans, $150 million. When Michael Jordan retired the first time before he came back with the Wizards, he was the third largest sporting good apparel company in the world. Number one is Nike, number two is Reebok, number three is Air Jordan. And don't you know one year alone, he earned more than $250 million in sales just off of his cologne. Hey, you catch my drift. And when will you know that you got a dream? Because the dream stealers will try to take it. The dream stealers will try to take your dream. You are blessed to live in a capitalistic economy. See, capitalism is not a dirty word. Capitalism means everything is for sale. You are blessed to live in an economy, a country that has produced 5 million millionaires. 478 billionaires. 5 million millionaires, 478 billionaires. Number one, Bill Gates, Larry Ellison of Oracle, depends how the stock market is doing. Top five, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway. Started Berkshire Hathaway, 1956, $109,000, only 1,000 of it was his. At one time, number 70 was Estelada, number 71, Martha Stewart. We certainly know who number 478 is, girlfriend in Chicago. What more proof do you need? Come on, what proof do you need? I'm not telling you you gotta be like Oprah Winfrey, you have to go through all the nonsense, all the burdens that she had to go through. Now her name is on the rolls of billionaires. But what I am saying, five million millionaires in the United States, average millionaire doesn't get his or her dream to age 45, doesn't become a millionaire at age 54. Five million millionaires in the United States, they dib and dabble in 17 different concepts, businesses, money-making schemes, doesn't hit it big to the 18th try. 3.2% of all millionaires go bankrupt on the road to millionaireship. 30% have a Sears card, 40% have a J.C. Penny card. You'd be hard pressed to find a millionaire in a suit worth more than $400 as you wear your Chanel and Hugo Boss. <laughs> Broke. The car they drive is at least five years old. As you drive your Lexus and Infiniti and now we're into Bentleys. <laughs> Good and broke. Four, there you go. 
Nine times out of ten, they're married to the first spouse in excess of 20 years. Listen to me, men. I know you didn't come to hear that. I've been married 32 years. See, I go to the gym three times a week, man. I go to the gym three times a week. See, this is malehood. See? I put my I put my work in, but this is manhood. <laughs> uh, which one do you want? <laughs> the drink of choice is beer, and they drink two types of beer: Budweiser and Free. <laughs> one out of every 854 people you bump into is a millionaire. Now, who do the 854 listen to? The other 854. Who does the one listen to? The inner beatings of his or her heart. Point number two, next to last point, commit yourself to personal excellence. Don't be average. Average is best of the worst, worst of the best, top of the bottom, bottom of the top. Several years ago, I had a presentation out in LA. Delta Airlines flying out to LA from my Atlanta home. Put my notebook computer, get ready for this four hour flight. Go out there right before the plane takes off. The seat right next to me was empty before the plane takes off. Who comes out of the washroom, takes a seat right next to me? Earl Woods, Tiger Woods' father. And for more than four hours, I had a captive audience, and this is right after Tiger won the Masters the first time. The second year, he did not repeat as Masters champion. You talk about a commitment to personal excellence. So I wait till we get up about 33,000 feet. He was reading his newspaper. I didn't want to disturb the man. But as we settled in, I do what I do best, I begin to probe. And I said to him, I said, Mr. Woods, was your son upset that he did not repeat his master's champion? He said, no. He said, Tiger's glad the whole ordeal is over with, he's pretty exhausted. I said, what do you mean pretty exhausted? He said, well, very few people realize my son's practice schedule. I said, what is your son's practice schedule? He said, Tiger hits minimum 1,000 golf balls a day. I said, what? 1,000? I said, how long does that take him? He said, between five and six hours. I said, every day? He said, yes, every day. And see, and what you don't know, that after Tiger Woods won the Masters the first time, CBS Sports, that, you know, had the presentation, gave him a videotape of all four days' performance, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And when anybody else would be out having a good time, Tiger gets back to his Florida home, gets back about 10 o'clock at night, dons the green jacket, hangs it up in his closet, puts in the first videotape, it's after 10 o'clock at night, Begins to sign some autographs, gets his affairs in order, seems like he's been gone forever. Puts in the second videotape, now it's 12 o'clock midnight. Begins to answer some correspondence, gets all his mail, his voicemail. Puts in the third videotape, now it's between 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. And when he puts in the third videotape, something catches his eye. He looks at it, he picks up the phone, he calls his personal coach, Butch Harmon, and he says, Come over right now, I see a flaw in my swing, I want to practice. And you wonder why it's number one. Don't be average. And last but not least, you got to believe in yourself when no one else will. I want you to be like Sammy. Oh, yeah. Sammy is eight years old in the third grade, painting a picture at his desk. The teacher comes by and says, Sammy, what are you doing? Sammy says, I'm painting a picture of God. Teacher says, well, no one knows what God looks like. Sammy says they will in a minute. You've got to believe in yourself. And you talk about believing in yourself when no one else will. I told you what I did. I got a letter from Lucille Singleton. You don't even know who Lucille Singleton is, do you? Lucille Singleton, one of the grandmothers that sent me a letter, retired as a domestic, age 70, cleaned up the homes for wealthy people in New York, retires at age 70. She doesn't know what she wants to do for the rest of her life, except she wants to join the New York Road Runners Club, and as the runners come by, hand them their water. So she joins the New York Road Runners Club, and she does that, and don't you know that the runners and the members of the club say, Miss Singleton, we're honored that you're a member of our organization and we're glad that you hand us a water and sometimes you even hold the finish line tape. But you know what? You need to run one of these races. You need to really get involved. She says, child, 
Do you know how many floors? Do you know how many floors this body has scrubbed? Do you know how many shirts, blouses, dresses these hands and arms have ironed? This body isn't going anywhere. Well, for six years, they wear her down and wear her down. At age 76, she runs the New York Marathon. Eight hours and two minutes. And she wrote to me in that letter and she says, guess what? I didn't even come in last place. But she, yeah. But you listen to me. You listen to me as if I'm reading from the gospel. She has a quote in her letter that says it all. She says, so many times people make commitments until real life shows up. Get a vision, commit yourself to excellence, and believe in yourself when no one else will. Somebody said it couldn't be done, but he with a chuckle replied that maybe it couldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say till he tried. So he buckled right in with a trace of a grin on his face. If you worried he'd hit it, he started to sing as he tackled the thing. Couldn't be done and he did it. Somebody scoffed, oh, you'll never do that. And at least no one ever has done it. But he took off his coat and he took off his hat. And the first thing we know, he begun it with a lift of his chin <laughs> and a bit of a grin without any doubting or quitting. He started to sing as he tackled the thing. It couldn't be done and he did it. There are thousands to tell you cannot be done. There are thousands of prophecy failure. There are thousands ready to point out to you one by one <laughs> the dangers that wait till assail you. But with a lift of your chin, and a bit of your grin, you just take off your coat and go do it. You started to sing as you tackle the thing. Spit in his face, show you Marcus Garvey. Slam the school door in her face, she becomes Mary McLeod Bethune. Call him a slow learner, he turns out to be Benjamin Mace. Write him off as another fatherless black male, I'll show you Ben Carson. <laughs> Tell her she can't write, she becomes Toni Morrison. Tell her she can't lead, she becomes Janetta Cole. <laughs> Disobey his orders and I'll show you Colin Powell. Blind him, he becomes Stevie Wonder. Rape her, she becomes Maya Angelou. Put her in a wheelchair, she turns out to be Barbara Jordan. Confine him to the frigid snows of the North Pole and I'll show you Matthew Henson. Put him in a prison cell, throw away the key, Nelson Mandela, Malcolm X. Deny him adequate startup capital, becomes Earl Graves, John Johnson, and tell him, man, you're going to have a power what? Cleveland, you got to be kidding me, brother. And in this tight economy, you must be sick, insane, and out of your mind. What did Mary tell Martha? He is Abel George Frazier. I'm out of here. Dennis Kimbrough, Dr. Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, we love you.